when I receive a book that makes bold proclamations on its back cover, such as, this book will provide a fresh new mindset or a paradigm shift about Christianity, I delve in looking for inspiration and insight. Sadly, relentless, the power you need to never give up provided neither inspiration nor insight. Does this book provide a bold new mindset or paradigm shift regarding Christianity? In a word, no. Bevere's original intent seemed plausible. The Christian life is to be lived relentlessly or with a dogged determination to live as Christ did. The initial preamble, however, seemed a bit off as Bevere provided his pivotal verse from Romans 5.17. All who receive God's abundant grace and are freely put right with him will rule in life through Christ. From the phrase rule in life, Bevere builds a straw man argument that this implies our God-vested right to govern our lives on earth. All allusions back to this premise are dovetailed with convenient scriptural allegory to our being in charge or ruling over things. Before delving into what really bothers me about the way this book is written, it is important to clarify a brief context of Romans 5.17. Quite simply, the distinction appears to be a contrast of death's reign in our lives and subjugation to sin due to Adam's original sin, and the ability of the believer to live above sin or reign as a king through the accomplished work of Christ. Bevere's insistence that this verse implies a type of lordship over the quality of our lives is patently wrong and sets an amazing precedent for the eisegesis which informs his writing. Eisegesis is reading something into a biblical text that does not exist in context, as contrasted with exegesis, which means to draw meaning out of a biblical text. A little later in the book, Bevere turns to Daniel's faithfulness as a proof text of living relentlessly. As a quick reminder of the context of Daniel chapter 6, King Darius was quite impressed with Daniel's abilities. Daniel was the epitome of faithfulness and Darius was going to promote him to a position over his entire kingdom. Most certainly this disappointed the other officials who decided that the only way that they would be able to bring any charge against Daniel would be if they could do it in such a way as to violate his religious devotion. As the story goes, they cajole Darius to make an irrefutable law prohibiting prayer to anyone but him. When Daniel remains faithful to his religious conviction, he becomes a lunch for a pit of lions. Bevere implies that Daniel was ten times more knowledgeable, innovative, or creative than any of the other officials, and the fact of Daniel's excellence spurned envy in their hearts. Such is the author's speculation that this is the only reason why they would make a law not allowing prayer to anyone but the king. The context only divulges, however, that Daniel had an extraordinary spirit and does not go into detail about his innovation or his creativity. Were the officials envious? Absolutely. Perhaps they feared being left behind. Reading anything more than that into the text is blatant eisegesis. While you will not find definitive exegesis of the biblical text Bevere uses to support his ongoing thesis, you will find hubris. Just because someone has written a number of books does not mean they should remind their readers of that accomplishment every few chapters. Apparently, in Bevere's mind, living a relentless Christian life means that you should vaunt your accomplishments to all those around you. I was offended when I read that the author has a dream to go back to his high school English teachers and show them the 15 books he's written, by God's grace, of course, watch them faint, and then revive them and lead them to Christ. In Bevere's writing, you will also find isogesis, as mentioned earlier. Reference to many different scriptures are made, but their meanings always seem to be somewhat twisted to suit the message. 
For the uninitiated, watch how frequently a writer will change the version of scripture they use. The author quotes from multiple versions of scripture, and the reason for this is to demonstrate that what is written is aligned with scripture. If you look hard enough, you can find a version that has the precise word order or word choice that allegedly proves your point. And this graphic demonstrates that exegesis, by contrast, is really the essence of biblical communication where a writer writes a message in a context and encodes that into the text and then the reader decodes that message into his context, occasion, or culture and gets the meaning. Anything else that is put into a text is eisegesis. When you derive meaning out of a text following this kind of example, you receive the true meaning the Bible implies. As if hubris and eisegesis isn't enough, you will also find authoritarianism. Bevere indicates that those who would differ with him are motivated by ill motive. Although this is precisely what the Bible commends as diligent reading in verses such as Acts chapter 17, verse 11. From the New Living Translation, we read, And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Apparently, this is a verse that Bevere forgot to read when he wrote Relentless. And finally, Bevere implies a certain level of exclusivity. Whenever an author implies that 98% of Christians simply do not get it, a red cautionary flag should be raised. I do not recall the source, but one of my undergraduate professors in biblical studies said something akin to, when someone finds something in scripture that no one has ever seen before, nine times out of ten, they are absolutely wrong. So what is the verdict? Those seeking a fresh new mindset or a paradigm shift about Christianity should look elsewhere. Bevere's Relentless is not safe for public use.